episode 27. You know, I just came off of recording uh, a really fun and wholesome episode of Hunter x Hunter. So yeah, you know, this should kind of uh, even it out, balance it out, you know? <laughs> Though I probably should have recorded this first, right? <laughs> but you know, I'm excited nonetheless. But let's get into it. Ah. Look at this. So, I suppose they're separated at this point. Mm, she's gonna say no. Or I'll think about it. Oh, a photo? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, that's a theme. One of the reoccurring themes, of course. Fair enough. Fair enough. But also fair enough from her perspective as well, right? That is something difficult to come back from. His situation. And how it affected his family. Easy, easy. Wow. Sound design though. Careful, careful. Coffee's good. Black coffee's even better. More coffee. Go for you. Hang in there, hang in there. <laughs> though I'm not sure how long he's going to be in a position to actually hang in there, right? <laughs> let's see, let's see. Proof. Ah. Oh, yes. Yes. I was expecting something like this. <laughs> Proof as in his memento, maybe? <laughs> but you do have a knack for it, Doctor. His character design is so expressive, isn't it? The eyebrows and the facial structure. There you have it. There's your death flag. <laughs> ただし、結構だ。そこから逃げ出そうとしても無理だ。その事実を消すことはできない。ただ大切な。そこから前へ進むことだ。よろしい。ね、ただ大切な。そこから前へ進むことだ。よろしい。ね、ただ大切な。そこから前へ
Stop that. Stop doing that. That's a death flag again. That's not creepy at all, Richard. Careful, Mel. He's going. He's he's going to be watched as well, though. Ah, interesting. Yeah, he can understand from that perspective. Oh no! Yeah, this is it. <laughs> it's like right in our faces at this point. Did she say no? His reaction to this is going to be really important. Yeah, like I said. It's, you know, he's feeling that sensation of it going down smoothly. Hi. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't do it, man. Not even, not even like a small one. Don't. Whiskey. There's still a chance to walk away. You don't have to drink it. Push it, push it aside. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, they're making it look really quite appetizing there. Appetizing is not the right term. Uh, push it, push it. Yeah, he walked up. He walked up. Good for you. I'm sure he paid for it. Yeah, he paid for it. I mean, that was quite the test for himself. Oh, yes. You know, I've got to say, I love the focus in this episode. The proof. Oh, I love this. Oh. Every single time, it just kind of hits you. Mm, how about that? Oh, right. Something changed? Ah, Johan, Johan, it's gotta be Johan. Friday's boy. That he is, that he is. Everything. I think Johan wants this. It's playing out perfectly. Oh boy. Don't do this to yourself, Carl. Don't do this. Of course, of course. Mm. Alright, alright, okay, he's getting into it now. He's gonna have to Yeah, he's gonna have to prove Unless Tell him those things then, once you get a chance. There it is, the proof, the memento. Go on then. <laughs> He doesn't want to put it out there because then he knows. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, 
<笑>いや、ちょっと <laughs> Oh boy. Oh boy. Interesting. Let's see. There's two different angles from that point, right? お前の本当のお父さんお母さんはどこかで生きているかもしれない。私たちはどうやっても本物になれないかもしれないが、そんなことありません。お二人は本当のお父さんとお母さんです。You know the funny thing is, okay, I don't want to spoil anything from Hunter x Hunter. Gone in Mito san. Kampaida. <laughs> Johan. Or? Oh no, did Johan? He might have, he might have. He did. He talked to him. So did he end up giving it to Johan, the memento? I think he might have, off screen. Oh, he's here. I think Johan did the thing. Because it was from the heart. Yeah, yeah, Johan, Johan did the thing. Interesting. Rabbit's foot. Interesting. Interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about Johan's approach. How about the adopted parents, though? The perfect boy. <laughs> ah, there it is. He's in. He's in. My God. That's a good ending point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that really truly is the perfect ending shot, isn't it? The final shot to this episode. Uh, the perfect boy. Right? I mean, even, even the face in that shot, it just kind of looks like a doll, doesn't it? A perfect porcelain doll. And it kind of leans into this really interesting uh, contrast between the, the psychologist that, um, uh, that Richard goes to, right? His sensei, as he calls him, and Schubert, and their take on perfect people. You see that Schubert really holds him in high regard, right? And he, he has come across one. He has come across the perfect being. He excels in everything. Hell, he even has a handsome face. Uh, blessed with a handsome face. And then on the flip side, you've got the psychologist who doesn't care. He doesn't care much for you know perfect scores or perfect people, right? It doesn't do it for him. Um, because, you know, he, yeah, I think he feels that, you know, most people are not perfect. It's unrealistic. The expectation of that is unrealistic, right? Most people are just not like it. And then, of course, you've got the outlier, right? You've got Johann Lieber. Essentially, he's done it. He's done it. He's in. He got in, right? Uh, but in doing so, he also reunites a father with his son and a son with his father. And yes, of course, there's a clear element of him gaining important insight and using Carl to gain Schubert's trust, right? He did it. He did it really quite effectively. 
um, you know, uh, step by step. He got the information he needed. He ultimately got that information out of, uh, not Schubert, sorry, out of Carl, right? The memento establishes him as the real deal. He got that information out of him. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it was it was going to be one or the other. Is he, is he now about to take Carl out of the picture altogether? Or is he about to reunite them, right? And then use that. I mean, essentially use it as something incredible that he's done for Schubert. Right, something so undeniably incredible that Schubert simply has to, you know, take this next step, right? Uh, but yeah, you know, beyond that ulterior motive, perhaps, um, you know, that he is he is trying to get in, you know, there is an interesting angle to explore here. You know, ultimately, did did Carl's story, did Carl's background, his upbringing, uh, and again, it being really quite similar to Johann's own upbringing. And background in in certain in in a certain light, at least um, there you know there's some differences, of course, you know, in Johan's upbringing, but there are certain similarities that he can certainly uh, relate to, right? Um, again, you know, th- there's a scene that happens, right? Was it just purely crocodile tears, or was there a bit of actual empathy, perhaps, uh, mixed in there as well? You know, maybe maybe a tiny bit, but yeah, you know. Ultimately, I suppose at this point, you can only kind of speculate uh, until, I don't know, it plays out a bit further. You know, the, the thing is, who knows how far back all of this planning goes, you know, in terms of gaining uh, Schubert's trust, in terms of uh, becoming friends with um, uh, Carl, right? Um, hell, you know, do, could it possibly even go a bit further back? Uh, you know, him actually setting a lot of this into motion, right? Did he need Carl to come into this? But also, let's not forget the other guy, the guy who hung himself. You know, I'm doing air quotes as I'm saying that. Um, you know, Johan did a number on him, right? And then, of course, he, I don't know, he he kind of took him out of the picture. The moment Carl comes onto the scene, the real deal. But yeah, ultimately, by the end of it, he reunites the father and the son. Right, and he gains quite the position, right? Quite the position. But, but there is, you know, the chapter isn't closed. There is another person that is attached to this, and that is Richard, right? He told, he told uh, Schubert that no, no, you know, uh, there's something here. I'm going to investigate this, right? So he's still at it. Um. So yeah, you know, that could be the next part of this, perhaps. And the tricky part is, and perhaps the unfortunate part is, he could he could make himself a speed bump, a speed bump for Johann Liebert, right? Because now, uh, you know, it's essentially kind of almost feeling like okay, now Richard is a bit of the loose end, right? Because again, he's he's firmly on the case. He believes there's something really fishy at play here, right? So, yeah, let's see how it plays out. You know, Richard, I'd say Richard's focus or the focus on Richard's story is one of the standouts of this episode because it is it is one of the it's a focal point of the episode you know Richard's internal struggle uh his external struggle as well um you know he's certainly on the right path he is right uh but there's uh, you know he's it feels like he's he's always kind of close to the edge Right, or at least he approaches the edge a few times in this episode as well, right? And uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that that's the end of it. I feel like you know, if it is going to, if that is going to be a focus of this, um, or sorry, if Richard is going to be a focus of this, I'll probably get to see a bit more of that, right, throughout the next few episodes. Him kind of approaching that edge in Richard, you truly get to see a man who is trying to better himself, right? who is on the right path. I mean, this is a person that has a lot of regret, right? And of course, you know, acceptance is one of the key components of this, you know, accepting the things that you did, right? You know, don't don't put them to the side. Don't bury them. Accept them. You know, accepting and understanding your behavior that led down that path so you don't fall back in line with that behavior, right? Uh, The psychologist, uh, his sensei, um, he tells him as much, right? You know, you yeah, it's good that you're accepting of all of this, you know, that you're not burying any of this. Uh, that That's key. And he also tells him, you know, uh, be realistic. You have to be realistic about 
uh, your expectations, right? Uh, you cannot take back the things that you've lost. And this is, uh, this is, of course, after he tells him potential good news that he might actually get to meet his daughter. Of course, a bit later, it turns out that she's not open to meeting him at the moment. And, you know, there's setbacks. That's one of the setbacks, right? And every time there's a setback, you see, you see that he kind of approaches that edge, edge of that cliff. He gets really close to the edge of that cliff at one point. Right, the temptation. And you know, there's an interesting thing at play here. You know, I mean, I'm I'm you know, I'm choosing to look at it as a deliberate setup that he is going into a bar setting, that he is deliberately surrounding himself with temptation. Right? I mean, it's it's quite the approach. It really is, you know, because of course, you know, you could easily just go to a cafe, you know, go for a coffee. I mean, yeah, he's having coffee, but it's it's at a bar, right? He's right there at the heart of it, right? It's at his fingertips. At a moment's notice, he can get a drink as he does. After a bit of a devastating setback, right? He almost, almost falls off the wagon, right? And listen, you know, even though I'm, I'm kind of on his side and I'm happy for him that, you know, he resisted, that he dug deep and he held firm. Listen, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's the last of it. You know, temptation might come up again. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting approach to surround yourself, to be in that bar setting, perhaps as a test of his newfound resilience, right? Uh, restraint. Um, at least that's my, um, I don't know, that's my take on the matter because otherwise it's really kind of productive, isn't it? To go into a bar, to surround yourself, um, to have it uh, at your fingertips. Right. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt that it's by design, that he's really, truly maybe testing himself. But, you know, it easily could be just I don't know. That's just how it is. That's how it's written. You know, um, he chooses to meet up in a bar. And yeah, that, that'd be I don't know that again, uh, counterproductive. And of course, you know, through Richard's uh, journey at this point, you see a lot of the reoccurring themes of the story. Right. I mean, at this point, you could you could have a whole therapy session. <laughs> you know, you can get a lot of them in there. You could get Ava in there. You could get maybe Lunga in there at some point. Uh, you've got Richard. Uh, who's the other guy? Rudy. Right. Rudy. If you get a lot of these characters together, there's a lot of regret, a lot of regret there. Right. Um, you know, self-destructive behavior, you know, um, maybe not focusing on the right things, um, you know, workaholics. There's so many of them in there. And again, you know, like I said, it, it really, really makes me think about Urasawa. You know, a lot of these characters have exhibited self-destructive tendencies, right? And then after a certain point, kind of beginning to understand the importance of the things they've lost, understanding the importance of the time that they've lost. Uh, you know, time is so damn precious. You know, I say it all the time. And, you know, I, I, I just truly feel that. I truly feel it. And, you know, um, it, this is something that kind of hit me a few years ago, you know. Um, it hit me really quite hard, actually, a few years ago. And, you know, since then, I've been really quite mindful of how I spend my time, right? And how I kind of allocate uh, my time to certain things, certain things that are really quite important that or that should be important to me, uh, you know, things like family. You know, certain goals that I have, certain things that I want to accomplish, certain things I, you know, I just really want to do before I move on to a different part of my life. And ultimately, this collection of characters that I kind of mentioned at the moment um, that could kind of make up that uh, group therapy session, they just feel so human, so human. I mean, I see some of myself in uh, some of these characters or at least some characteristics of these uh, characters, right? Uh, I'm sure many of us can see much of ourselves in many of them. I mean, yeah, sure, I've had self-destructive tendencies. You know, I, I have regrets. Uh, I'm sure many of you can relate. Uh, so yeah, you know, these these characters, yeah, these are really, really quite authentic and nuanced, aren't they? Um, and, you know, of course, uh, I hope for the best for Richard. I really do. But that being said, you know, uh, death flag plenty of times throughout this episode. And the thing that's made really clear by the psychologist or the therapist or his therapist specifically is that he simply must not, must not go close to a drink. 
right? That's that's really being set up here as the tipping point, right? Because again, you know, all of them know, they know uh, the effect that it had on Richard, the things it can do to Richard. There's that really stunning sequence earlier on, right? As he struggles with a bit of that trauma, right? Of shooting that individual, that young man. Uh, now, you know, it appears that essentially it had no connection to Johan at all. Um, as of this point, at least, it feels like it didn't have much of a connection. I, I thought it did a great job of depicting the struggles of someone who is a recovering alcoholic, right? Someone who does suffer from that trauma because of the path he ends up going down because of that substance abuse, right? Um, you know, there's an up-close shot that I've seen before um, a few times at this point, really kind of putting us in their headspace. And how about the immaculate sound design in this episode, right? You see those sirens that trigger him. And then, you know, it kind of, he kind of zones out and has that, you know, panic attack, has that episode, essentially. But then also inside of the bar, the sights and sounds of that drink, right? You, you see that he can feel, he can almost kind of, it's almost like a transportive experience for him, right? It takes him back to a time. He can feel that sensation, right? Of the drink uh, just kind of going down smoothly, right? My God, my God, it's it's really quite effective. And, you know, the directing of this anime has been really quite uh, impressive. But, you know, here in this episode specifically, it's, you know, it's a standout. In so many of these scenes, right, one of the standout moments of this episode for me from a directing standpoint is the Carl and Johan scene, right? I, oh my God, I love how they present Johan in this scene, right? You almost never get to see the top half of his face. You never get to see his eyes, uh, for at least a long chunk of that scene. And for the most part, throughout that scene, throughout that conversation, it, you just kind of get to see his back. And you see that Carl really hates himself for being jealous at all. That, you know, maybe Schubert might have thought that, uh, you know, Johan really truly could be the perfect son, right? I think I think he even kind of mistook that change in expression for a smile. Maybe, maybe you could call it a subtle smile, but... To me, you know, it felt more like a subtle change in expression. But, you know, Carl is so hypersensitive at that moment, right? He's looking for anything. He, he shouldn't hate himself. He's human. That whole, you know, that whole reaction is just so human, isn't it? But of course, you know, after the whole, you know, back and forth about, you know, you know, why exactly he doesn't want to, you know, tell his father about his true identity. Yeah, you know, there's that big moment. There's that big moment, isn't there? Um, as he finally tells uh, Johan that, yeah, indeed, there is a memento. There is something that can distinguish me as, you know, his true son. Uh, and then, and then you get to see the bottom half. You get to see a bit of that smirk, that smile, that devious smile on Johan's face, right? And then, and then, you know, he slowly enters the frame. And, you know, he kind of walks over and there he's kind of like this looming presence, isn't he? You know, he's really quite slim. Um, and, you know, just slim and tall. But there in that frame, he really kind of filled it up. Now, of course, you know, it all kind of leads to quite a beautiful and touching moment, actually, the reunion, right, Schubert and Carl. But, you know, I, I can't help but at that moment, you know, I was immediately still thinking about his adoptive parents, right? And that really beautiful scene earlier on in the episode. Um, and listen, you know, maybe I'm being a little bit harsh, maybe. But, you know, a part of me is is at the moment thinking about that maybe Carl is using them as, uh, I don't know, this emotional safety net, perhaps, right? Because again, you know, he's been through a lot, a lot of trauma himself, that he is accepting of their love, but at the same time also keeping a bit of distance, or that he has kept a bit of distance up until this point. But then, you know, you see by the conclusion of the episode that maybe realistically and understandably kind of, you know, his reaction to connecting with his biological father is much more emotional, much more meaningful to him in comparison to these uh, lovely people, adoptive parents that are really taking care of him, right? He said he said as much that, you know, they've been incredible, certainly much more, much more so than his biological father. But, you know, there there is something different there, right? Biological father at the end of the day, right? It, it, it's funny. It's funny how people... Uh, approach things because Schubert himself is so apologetic for you know everything he's put his son through you know throughout his life up until this point so yeah let's see how it all plays out if if there is anything else to it 
you know, his adoptive parents, I, I certainly hope so. You know, these are lovely people. So let's see how Carl approaches this now, right? Uh, essentially, he's got two sets of parents at this point, right? That's how I'm kind of looking at it right now. Uh, and yeah, maybe he'll, he'll, he'll tell uh, Schubert all about them. And also, you know, finally, I think... I think one thing that this this anime could be better at is kind of establishing, I don't know, the passage of time. Because of course, you know, you see that he's become much better at his readings, right? And, you know, no matter how fantastic of a teacher Johan is, it's still going to take a bit of time, right? Johan cannot transfer, you know, his skill level overnight or anything to Carl, right? Carl still has to be diligent. So that, that is going to take a bit of time. So you just technically have to assume that, yeah, there's been a, a certain amount of time that's passed. I don't know. It didn't really do a great job of kind of establishing the passage of time, I suppose, in my opinion, at least. But yeah, I think that should do it for this one, folks. If you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. If you are interested in uh, early access or perhaps even timer-based full length, consider checking out the Patreon page uh, and potentially supporting the channel. Um, the links are in the description and the pinned comment also links to social media if that's your thing right then thank you so much for joining me folks and thank you for your time because time is precious it really is and I do hope to see you again soon for the next one until then take it easy